Hello everybody and welcome to the Curious Geographer live interviews. Today we are very excited to be joined by Professor Susan Page. This is actually our last live interview of our kind of first term of live interviews so please say hi in the comments and as I always say if you do have questions when we go through please just comment them um, and then I'll be able to ask our guest. So for those who are new to my channel don't forget to hit subscribe and as I said we are interviewing academics, professionals, journalists so there's actually 10 previous interviews so please go back and check them out on the playlist as well. So today we are going to be talking about peatlands and particularly the the role in the carbon cycle, like why they're threatened. Um, it's going to link to lots of the water and carbon cycles, which I know a lot of you study for A level, it's a compulsory topic. But then also, if you do GCSE, it links to kind of impacts of deforestation, which I know a lot of you are very interested in studying as well. So, Professor Susan Page is a professor of physical geography at the University of Leicester. Professor Susan Page is an ecologist actually by training with research interests in wetland ecology and um, um, functioning and wildlife conservation. However, her primary fo um, research focuses on tropical peatlands in Southeast Asia. So we are, that's what we're mainly going to be talking on. However, Professor Susan Page also is involved in research projects on peatlands in South America, Central Africa, and the fens of Eastern England. So I'm gonna pass over to um, Professor Susan Page. So if you could just introduce yourself and let us know a bit about you, that'd be absolutely, absolutely fantastic. Hi everybody. So, uh, as Ellie has already introduced me, I'm Sue Page. I'm at the University of Leicester and uh, I'm a scientist uh, by background and by training. But uh, as all of you will know, who are taking geography at either A-level or GCSE, geography is a really broad subject. So, in the departments in which I work, I work with other scientists, but I also work with human geographers who are effectively social scientists. And uh, a lot of projects that I'm involved in now, some of which Ellie has mentioned, uh, involve uh, quite a mix of disciplines. So geography is the right place to be if you are interested in combining uh, science with social science or maybe even with anthropology. So my background's really not actually in geography. So perhaps I'm not really a true geographer after all. My trained as a, I actually trained as a biologist, but you will find that in geography departments across the UK, there are lots of people who've come to the subject who've come in from uh, quite a wide range of different uh, uh, areas of training and expertise. Super, and today what I'm really excited about is learning more about peatlands. And I find that for, we often teach about deforestation and we know that, for example, rainforests are big carbon stores and particularly when we're thinking about climate change, there's a lot of influence, uh, lots of um, information on what's the issues with cutting down trees. However, peat is also such a massive carbon sink and store and actually plays a massive role in both the carbon and water cycles, which is why I'm so interested. Um, and I feel I'm gonna learn lots today um, as well. Um, so what exactly is peat? Um, could you just kind of give us that sort of like some information about what is peat and then where are peatlands found? Okay, right. Well, you're absolutely right to say that uh, if you're interested in peatlands, you are interested in both the carbon cycle and the, and the water cycle. And the reason for that is because um, peat is made up, actually made up mostly of water. It has very little solid material in it. But uh, the solid material that you find in a peat is, it comes from the vegetation. So wherever you have really, really wet landscapes, uh, wherever water is being held on the on the land surface for whatever reason, poor drainage or whatever, uh, in those situations you're you, you're going to get vegetation, but most of the plant material that falls into that uh, wetland, the plant litter, dead leaves, trunks of trees, whatever it is, it's not really going to decompose particularly well because you haven't got very much oxygen available. So because you have water 
in the landscape, water in the soil, that excludes most of the oxygen from the soil. And without oxygen, you don't get much in the way of decomposition. And so over a long period of time, that organic material, the dead plant material, will build up uh, and start to form quite a deep deposit on, on the land surface. And because plant material is about 50% carbon by dry weight, so if you dry any kind of vegetation, doesn't matter what it is, uh, about 50% of that will be made up of carbon. So if you have a peatland, which is made up of partially decomposed plant remains, then it's going to be really, really carbon rich. But in addition to the plant remains, you've got all that water as well. So that's why I say, you know, the carbon and the water cycles are really intimately linked when you come to study peatlands. Um, so where are they found? Well, not surprisingly, they're found usually in places that are quite wet. <laughs> and that water might come from uh, rainfall. So uh, if you think about some of the really wettest places in the UK, then it's pretty likely you're going to find peatlands there. So the northern Pennines, for example, uh, large areas in Scotland, particularly the west of Scotland, the north of Scotland, uh, the uh, Welsh uplands, Exmoor, Dartmoor in the southwest of the country as well. So those are all places where you can find really extensive peatlands because in those locations, there's very high rainfall, quite low evapotranspiration and perfect conditions for uh, poor decomposition, waterlogged soils and the buildup of uh, peat over a long period of time. But peat isn't only found in the cold, uh, damp parts of the world. It's also found in the tropics. And for many people, that's really quite surprising because you think of the tropics um, of being, you know, hot. Uh, yeah, wet, but also hot. So you would think that uh, where you have higher rainfall, but also high temperatures, that you really wouldn't get the conditions for peatlands to form. But surprisingly... There are really extensive peatlands in parts of Southeast Asia, parts of Africa, parts of the Amazon Basin uh, as well. And mainly this is because of topography, where you've got really low-lying landscapes, where there's extremely poor drainage, uh, then water can uh, accumulate in those conditions. And as I said, you've got the high rainfall. So again, perfect for peat formation. And I actually um, heard this like a while ago when kind of when I was first kind of researching peat for when I was teaching it for A-level a couple of years ago. And it's isn't it true that we didn't quite know the scale of how many peatlands there were around the world just because it's so hard to measure that actually we, they were just quite unknown for a while? Yes. And it's, so the biggest area for peatlands is in Southeast Asia, which is where you're interested in. The biggest area of peatland in the tropics is in Southeast Asia. But if we stick in, stick with the Northern Hemisphere, then you've got huge expanses of peatland across North America. Much of Northern Canada is peatland. Um, very large areas of um, Northern Europe as well, particularly once you get into uh, Russia um, and Siberia, places like that, absolutely vast areas of peatland. So, you know, in terms of the UK, uh, as a whole, I think we've got about 10 to 15 percent peatland cover, but most of that's in Scotland. If you look at the world, uh, there's about 3 percent of the world's land surface is covered in peatland, which is actually quite a large area when you think that there are many places that are too dry, completely too dry. So large parts of Africa, you haven't got peatlands, for example. But um, in total, 3% uh, cover over the whole land surface, variable depths. So maybe from anything from half a meter to in some places, 10 meters, some places even 20 meters of peat have accumulated. And so the total carbon store is somewhere like 600 billion tons of carbon so just to put that in some sort of perspective um, that's probably about twice as much carbon as is stored in the world's forests 
So, uh, yeah, you mentioned deforestation as being a, a key issue. Um, and of course, that's important. And, uh, you know, forests are important uh, uh, long term carbon stores, but peatlands really are much more important when we think about this in a, in a global, on a global scale. Wow, and that, that scale, when you put it into that perspective, is is huge. Um, you mentioned um, about peat and the water and carbon cycle. So what exactly does peat play um, as a role in the water and carbon cycles? Okay, well, in terms of the carbon cycle, what's really, really important is if you have a peatland, which is in a completely intact condition, so it's covered in living vegetation and it's it's permanently wet then under those conditions the vegetation is going to be growing every year it's going to be taking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere um, and converting it to plant material by photosynthesis some of that plant material will decompose but as i've mentioned earlier some of it won't so some of that plant material will accumulate over you know thousands and thousands of years so you can think of a a peat bog as a really long-term carbon sink the vegetation's acquiring the carbon from the atmosphere converting it into plant material and a good part of that plant material then falls into the peat and is effectively trapped there uh, over maybe thousands of years maybe even 10,000 15,000 years um so you can you can think of these peatlands wherever they are if they're in a good condition as a kind of natural climate solution they're helping us to regulate the amount of co2 which is a greenhouse gas that we've got in the atmosphere the problem comes when we decide that we want to do something with our peatlands so we decide that they uh, the land is required for some other use maybe it's required for agricultural use for example or for forestry any kind of uh, 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 use for agriculture or forestry will mean that you have to lower the water table because your crop whether it's a tree or a or, or a, uh, some other sort of vegetable crop or whatever it won't grow if the roots are sitting in water. So we need to lower the water table. But as soon as we put in drainage and lower the water table, we're exposing uh, the uh, upper part of the peat to the uh, to oxygen. So we're bringing in air, we're bringing in oxygen. And so then we change what were previously anaerobic conditions to aerobic conditions. In come all the aerobic bacteria and they start to break down all that uh, uh, plant material and return the CO2, the carbon dioxide, back to the atmosphere. And that can happen really, really rapidly. So we go from having a really effective carbon sink to quite quickly being able to turn our peatlands into what then becomes uh, a carbon source, or a source of carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere, which is obviously concerning uh, you know, given the uh, issues with land use change, deforestation, all contributing to uh, much higher greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. So that's the carbon cycle side of it. And that's why I'm really interested in peatlands, because they're so fragile. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's this is very subtle change from being a sink to a source. And I'm really interested in how we can try to convert peatlands back to being um, sinks if possible but if not that then how we can reduce the 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 source of co2 into the atmosphere what can we do to manage our peatlands better water is also really important some people say that if you walk on a peatland you're actually walking on milk actually milk probably has more solids in it than peat so peat is if you ever get a chance to walk on a peat bog it's really springy it's really bouncy and the reason for that is because it's absolutely full of water. So it's maybe 90% water, far less than 10%, maybe even less than 5% uh, plant material. So clearly, if you have these vast areas of peatland on your landscape, they are wetlands. They're storing, holding water. You may not be aware of that until you start to disturb your peatland. 
And if you put in drainage channels for whatever reason, then the water is going to leave that land, that peatland, really, really rapidly. And I think we've seen that, actually, in some of the concerns we've had for flooding in the UK in the last few years. And people have, uh, in some of upland districts, they have actually said, well, maybe the reason that we're getting such extreme flooding in towns and villages that we didn't used to see in the past is because we've damaged the peat bogs and the peatlands are no longer holding the water that they used to hold. But it's, I think what's a really important message to get about peatlands and about the carbon and the water cycles of peatlands is actually they're linked. So, you know, you, you can't store carbon in a peatland unless it's super wet. So the, the two cycles are actually intimately linked. I would actually say they're intimately linked in forest ecosystems, and many other ecosystems as well. But I think in peatlands, it's even more interlinked. That's brilliant. And that's exactly what students study at A-level is the water and carbon cycle and therefore understanding those links and looking at them in that systems approach. So I think actually yes. that emphasis on the fact that they are integral um, would be really fantastic for students to understand their role that they play in both of them. You mentioned about like farming, potentially like threatening peatlands, but why are peatlands under threat? Okay, well, about 15% of peatlands around the world have been damaged by some form of human activity, which doesn't sound a lot. 15% doesn't sound a lot. But because of the fact that when they're drained, they liberate such vast amounts of, uh, uh, of carbon back into the atmosphere, peatland drainage may be responsible for 3% of all um, uh, global uh, greenhouse gas emissions. This is big. So, if, you know, 3% uh, uh, of all, uh, gre- all our greenhouse gas emissions are coming from uh, drained peatlands, even though we've only drained 15% of them. So um, peatlands are threatened by a whole range of activities. I think the, the, the biggest ones are, are to do with agriculture. Um, forestry to a, a lesser extent, but it's mostly uh, where we see peatlands have been drained. Um, they are mainly being drained so that people can grow crops, people can make some sort of productive use uh, of the land. So if we're in the UK, it might be in the uplands. Peatlands have been drained to improve grazing for sheep, for example. Uh, if it's in the lowlands in the UK, the fens of East Anglia. Peatlands have been drained there for several hundred years to improve the uh, uh, landscape for use for farming. So a lot of our UK vegetables at the moment in the in the supermarkets at the minute are actually coming from fen peats grown in eastern England. And then if you go further afield, particularly to Southeast Asia, where I do a lot of my research, then one of the biggest reasons for draining peatlands is to provide land for big really large scale plantations um, and it, it's pretty hard actually to get a, a handle on the scale of these peatlands particularly in Southeast Asia and I think Ellie's got a slide which has got perhaps a lake in the front and so this is actually looking across a vast landscape of uh, peatland. What you've got is a peatland lake Many of these peatlands have lakes on them. They're a kind of natural feature of these really big peatlands. Behind the lake, you can see a tropical peatland. It's a forest. It's a type of forest that we call peat swamp forest. But then if you look in the distance, you should be able to see just the start of a plantation. Okay, so you can see that a forest has been cleared and you can see some, perhaps not very obvious, but fuzzy lines disappearing into the horizon and those lines are drainage ditches so it gives you an idea of how intensive the drainage has to be to get the water off the peatland so that's uh you know a a, a, a landscape view giving you a, a kind of idea of the scale of drainage the peatland drainage in southeast asia has been for two main crops biggest one of which is palm oil, or oil palm, I should say. Oil palm plantations, which are um, planted 
uh, on drain peatland. And of course, they produce ultimately the, the fruit bunches from the palm trees produce something called palm oil, which you've probably all heard of. If you haven't heard of it, just go straight after this talk to your uh, food cupboard in the kitchen, get out a few products, and I bet you within about five or six packets, you'll have got to something that's got palm oil in it. So there's a huge demand for palm oil as a fairly cheap vegetable oil, and it's used in an amazing range of, uh, of products, everything from cornflakes through to um, even, um, to, you know, cosmetics and so on. So huge demand for, for palm oil. The other crop that's grown on, on quite a large scale is uh, our tree crops in Southeast Asia, and those are used for paper production. Um, and uh, so whether it's for photocopier paper or toilet paper, um, that's the other big use. As well as large scale plantations, we're increasingly seeing uh, uh, small scale farmers as well starting to come into peatlands in Southeast Asia and they're growing a much wider range of crops. Some of them are growing palm oil, um, but many of them are growing a, a, a range of other vegetable crops and so on. And of course, a country like Indonesia, where I work, has a really rapidly growing population. So People have a, you know, a, a, a requirement to find space, to find land uh, for farming so they can support their livelihoods, so they can support, support their families, support their children through school and so on. And so we're seeing an increasingly large area of peatland now being drained and used for small scale farming as well. So those are some of the, the main uses. And I think it's quite important to realise that, you know, Peatland drainage is happening all around the world. It's not something that's just confined to Europe. It's it's happening in Southeast Asia. It's happening in, in some countries in Africa as well. And they're all contributing to this really big uh, uh, carbon dioxide emission into the atmosphere. The other issue that you might have heard about uh, is fire because wherever we drain peatlands and it seems to be a particular issue in southeast asia is that the drained peat is also very much more susceptible to uh, ignition and we've had over the last 20 years some really very extreme wildfire events in southeast asia many of which have been uh, centered in the peatland areas and when the peat gets on fire, which it might do because local people are using fire to clear their land, then we get very, very high pollution incidents. So we don't just get uh, CO2 coming up into the atmosphere. These peat fires also produce a lot of particulate matter, um, uh, which is very, very damaging to human health as well. So drainage brings, peatland drainage brings with it a whole range of really quite difficult issues which are all a concern for a, for the environment but all, can also be a, a kind of social concern as well where you've got health impacts. Great um, I'm just gonna just say this now once we kind of got, um, got through some of our main questions if anybody does have any questions please put them in the comments and we'll be able to answer them as well so this is a really good opportunity to get thinking about questions because we've had so much information already which has been fantastic um and i think they're looking at the different range of impacts particularly as so like it is actually globally how peatlands have been used or altered by humans is very different in different areas i think it's always interesting like we have to as geographers know the different kind of rules and regulations around that as well um, what, how, but on that, um, can peatlands be governed and um, what are the challenges if we try to protect or manage peatlands? Well, governance of peatlands is a really, really a hot topic at the moment uh, for a whole range of reasons, partly because of the carbon, uh, uh, you know, concern, the concern about managing peatlands better because of their link with uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But it's challenging because I think you'll see from some of the photographs that have been on the screen that these are really often really big landscapes. 
if we really want to manage a peatland effectively, what we have to do is try to manage the whole peatland. So because any kind of impact anywhere in a peatland catchment is going to have a bigger impact, it's going to have a knock on consequence. So where you've got, for example, um, a, a landscape that's been partially drained for uh, a plantation, for example, next to a forest, that plantation drainage will have an impact kilometres into the forest because peat has what we call very, very high hydraulic conductivity. It's the, the ramifications of drainage in one part of the catchment will be felt in other parts of the catchment. So there's a really big edge effect of drainage. So that's a, a, a particular issue. It really, ideally, you would want to manage your whole catchment, but often you're not able to do that. And that's not just a problem in Southeast Asia. It's also a problem in the UK uplands, for example, as well. So trying to manage peatlands is, is complicated if you've got all these different uses going on on your peatland surface. What I'm really interested in and a number of other scientists are interested in at the moment is how we can reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from our peatlands. How can we stop them uh, from being such a, a strong source of carbon to the atmosphere. And the sorts of things that we're looking at are restoration. So can we restore the peatland? Can we block up the drainage ditches, get the hydrology back to a little bit where, more where it was before the drainage happened? And can we restore a vegetation cover on that peatland? That's one aspect. That's in the ideal situation. Can we restore something back to near normal, near intact conditions. If we can't do that, and maybe we can't do that because we have people living on the landscape and using the landscape. So if people have got livelihood expectations, they want to be able to continue to use the land, maybe they're small scale farmers in Indonesia, then maybe in those conditions, we can find some sort of compromise situation where we can reduce the emissions and still allow some economic use of the land. And that's that's a really difficult issue to try to come to terms with. But it, we think that probably the way forward will be to try to raise the water levels. If we can get the water levels up to nearer the surface, then we reduce the depth of aerobic peat that's decomposing. Uh, but we can still allow the farmers maybe to have some sort of use of the land. But that's fraught with all sorts of difficulties. But that's the, the type of research that I'm involved in at the moment. Even if we could get the emissions down by 50 percent, we, we really, really think we did achieved uh, you know, a, a good outcome and still retain the, the, the livelihoods for, for local people. Super. And um, I think there's like a few questions because we're going to kind of come up and I've got some up ones as well on that. But before we kind of get onto some questions, we have been asking um, everybody about this. What, um, how did you get to kind of where you are? I know you said before that you actually didn't um, initially study as a geographer. So could you tell us a bit about kind of your career and to, um, yeah, how you became a lecturer at University of Leicester? Okay, well, my PhD was concerned with uh, uh, wetlands. So I was interested in wetland ecology uh, right from the start, really, of my academic career. And um, I was really lucky that I saw a position advertised at the University of Leicester not long after I finished my PhD. And I actually managed to uh, get a, a lectureship there. Um, I say I was lucky because I think it was just a combination of the expertise that I'd been able to build up. I'd also had some teaching experience and that made me kind of uh, an interesting candidate. Since being at the University of Leicester, I have not always been in a geography department. Um, my background is actually biology. I was quite closely linked with uh, biological sciences for quite a few years at Leicester. Uh, but more, more recently, about uh, 20 years ago, I moved over into geography because I knew that that was where uh, I would feel most comfortable. And since being there, I've had the opportunity to work across the, the whole of our kind of academic discipline. And I now work really, really closely with uh, social geographers because if 
it's clear from what I've been telling you that particularly where we've got peatlands that are quite densely populated, it doesn't matter how good you are at understanding peatland science, if you don't understand peatland social science, you're not going to be able to implement the types of solutions that you think might work. So you've got to really work with people who understand the social uh, uh, dimensions uh, of, of geography as well as the, the science elements as well. Um, so I've actually got a few questions first, and I think that the idea that actually, as you said, geography is so interdisciplinary, and we use that word a lot when we get to university, but it's not often heard about at school, that actually geography, you can link with so many different subjects, and I think that's why people find it really interesting when they do study it, because it really becomes their kind of own subject or something that they're really interested in. So that's kind of what I always say to students when they're thinking about studying geography. And um, there's a few questions that have just um, come up and a, a question from, as, as people are still writing them as well. Um, a question from me is, um, actually I'll, I'll ask the one that's just come up on the screen first because it might kind of link to what I was thinking as well. So is there a way for those in charge to work with the locals to manage the issues around peatlands by creating jobs that might be lost um, that might be lost if they're not encouraged to farm, I think. Yeah, no, that's a that's that's a really challenging issue. Um, there isn't an easy solution, as you might guess. If I use the UK as a good example, so I mentioned earlier that a lot of the fens of eastern England, so the very low-lying flatlands of Cambridgeshire, parts of Lincolnshire, um, all under really quite intensive uh, farming, but a lot of those soils are peat soils, and we know that they are very strong sources of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So the government is, you know, it, our Department of Environment, for example, is really interested in finding ways that we can reduce those emissions. But then you've got to think about job security and food security. So that farming industry employs a huge number of people, and it's really important for the local economy. Uh, downstream and of course it's also important for food security so we expect to be able to go to the supermarket in the middle of the summer buy lettuce uh, buy radish buy celery whatever it is that we want to buy and we most of us prefer to buy UK produce and a lot of that produce at the moment comes from uh, our lowland peatlands in eastern England so I can't go to those farmers today and say look you're land is drained, um, your peatland is, 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 is a really strong carbon source to the atmosphere. Uh, I can't expect them to, on the one hand, um, listen to me as a scientist, and on the other hand, to kind of somehow give up their whole business. That's just not going to happen. So what we're doing with, in those situations, and really it also applies to Southeast Asia, is to find some sort of compromise. And you're right, there, there probably does have to be governments involvement and there may be government incentives uh, that might support this so through carbon markets for example that might be one possibility but but actually I would much prefer to work with the farmers directly and to use their own knowledge because they, they know their land they know how they're managing the land and they also want to protect their soils so the, the best solution seems to be worth to work directly with the farmers and look for opportunities to save carbon. Maybe we can raise the water levels during the winter period when they're not growing crops on the land, for example. In Southeast Asia, it's, uh, it, there may also be some you know, quite easy wins that don't involve huge policy directions and huge policy changes, because I think if you're waiting for a policy change, you could wait a very long time. And it's those farmers that also get impacted if there's changes in the water cycle as well. Um, so yes. it can massively impact. You, you mentioned earlier about human health, but particularly, I think it, it's, it's those local farmers, isn't it, who um, get impacted by also the smoke that occurs from fires. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And one issue I haven't mentioned is that, of course, if you're losing all that carbon from your peatland, over time, your carbon, your peat surface is actually lowering. So all of these peatlands every year, maybe by only a few millimetres, maybe by a few centimetres, maybe two or three centimetres, you're losing land surface height. 
So in eastern England, we're losing land surface height at about one centimetre a year. Doesn't sound much. But if you combine that with global sea level rise and the fact that most of East Anglia is below sea level, so it's reliant on pumped drainage to bring the water up from the land and pump it out into the North Sea, then that is a concern. And in Southeast Asia, it's the same. They may be losing land height in these peatlands by as much as four or, four, four or five centimetres a year. Now, that's a lot higher. And we're already seeing some landscapes that are starting to become inundated, flooded by high river, t uh, high river levels on a fairly regular basis. So again, it's in the farmer's interest to protect their land and to stop the carbon loss, to stop the land surface lowering as well, happening at you know happening at quite the same rate. Are we kind of so water and water and carbon? People's livelihoods are all very strongly linked. Mm -hmm. And you've kind of talked about that as well, but when um, for A level in particularly, students look at kind of players' actions and futures as well. Um, who's particularly when looking at Southeast Asia, and I know that when I teach at GCSE as well, we look at deforestation and the impact of palm oil, particularly that so many consumers um, have palm oil in so many of their products and actually might not even realize it because it's, it's like 172 different names for palm oil, I think, in our products. Um, Whose responsibility is it um, to protect peatlands? Is it TNCs or farm? I oh, you said farmers. Yeah, hard question. I'm guessing. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's a really good question actually, and I think if we just stick with palm oil because that's perhaps the one that's perhaps most well known to people. I think it's. T I think it's. I think there are several prongs, if you like, to attacking that issue, or to at least engaging with that issue initially and then and then doing something about it i think we're responsible so i've already mentioned that palm oil is in so so many products so we should be a bit more aware as consumers about what we're consuming and the the kind of uh, you know the, the consequences of that consumption um so that's one aspect to it um in terms of palm oil there are um certification standards so some of you will have seen on say peanut butter or something like that that's got palm oil in it, that you might have seen the symbol of the RSPO, that's the Round Table on Sustainable Palm Oil. So some suppliers of palm oil are certified, and that means that they have to abide by certain guidance in terms of how they manage their land. Um, so that's a sort of slightly improved standard that the consumer can look for when they're perhaps buying products in the, in the in the supermarket. But then ultimately, yes, it does come back to governance. It comes back to, um, it does come back to, to kind of, you know, awareness in, in political circles as well. But, you know, in political circles, there's always going to be a tension between economics and how you use your land to, you know, produce your country's uh, exports and uh, weighing that against the kind of environmental impacts uh, of, of, that, of that production. But some of the biggest companies involved in uh, peatland use in Southeast Asia, for example, are increasingly aware of their impacts and they are starting to engage with, whether it's certification by RSPO or other ways in which they can demonstrate that they're trying to manage their land in a more sustainable way. So it's it's a slow process of getting the the scientific ideas out into uh, into the communities that really matter. And then that kind of leads me well, probably into the final one question. In terms of futures, then, what do you do? You see there being a um, like positive and um, effective governance using scientists working, as you said, with local farmers. Or do you think the rise of population and increasing demand um, that populations have, that they're just going to be increasingly under threat and more damaged? I think, I think in a lot of countries, uh, particularly in Europe now, we're starting to see many governments now really strongly engaging with uh, natural climate solutions. And that involves restoring peatlands, trying to convert our peatlands back from carbon sources to carbon sinks. And we saw that in the last um, 
uh, uh, big budget that we had in the in the UK that actually I think probably for the very first time ever peatland was mentioned in a UK uh, 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 budget so by the by the Chancellor of the Exchequer so that was him announcing that there were going to be funds to um, restore peatlands and they've set a target of twenty of thirty five I think it is thirty five thousand hectares of peatland in the UK to be restored. Um, so that's encouraging news. In other parts of the world, um, I think the, there is starting to be a build-up of, of understanding of the uh, importance of protecting peatlands. The situation is that it's actually much easier to encourage governments to protect intact peatlands. So if you've already got an intact peatland, the wonderful peatlands of the Congo Basin, for example, are almost completely intact. And the really vital thing is that we in, we encourage the governments in the Congo Basin to keep those peatlands in that condition because then they're always going to be there as a really uh, impressive and um, long-term carbon sink. It's much more difficult once you've drained your land and you have people living on that land uh, in Indonesia, for example. So I'm not quite so optimistic in Indonesia but we continue to work there and hope that we can at least come up with some perhaps uh, solutions which are going to suit both the, um, the policymakers and, and the, the people who are actually living on the land. But that's going to be a much harder, uh, much harder job for us. Now that is, again, as you said, even as you've answered it, that's such a really great geographical way to answer a question on futures and governance actually being like, well, it's in some areas, there are these policies and in other areas um, might need different strategies or it might take more time. So I think actually that in itself has been really good just to hear um, you as a, as a geography professor talking about the complexities because no answer is really straightforward. Um, well, thank you so, so much for um, talking about your area of interest. I mean, I know I've learned a lot and I know that everybody else um, would have as well, but particularly with a focus on like the water and carbon systems, um, you've just given us so much knowledge and I know that many students will be probably told to watch this in the future um, <laughs> from their teachers. So can I just say a massive thank you for taking the time out of your day? It's a pleasure. And if anybody's got any questions, they're very welcome to contact me by email. Super. OK, and I'll, um, I'll let them know that maybe in the comments as well. So thank you very much. Just going to give everybody some information. Um, there is no lecture next week, um, no interview next week. But here is a photo, this side, <laughs> um, of all the other live interviews we've had. So as I said, this was our 11th one and final one for this term, but there are 10 other lectures as well for you to check out. So whether that is on heat waves or um, international water conflicts, vulnerability, more disasters, geopolitics, um, climate emergency, there's so much on there. So please do have a look at the playlist and stay tuned. We will be back in the next term with many more exciting live interviews to come as well and if you haven't already if you scan the QR code which is down here um, then you will get linked to an interactive PDF which kind of tells us everything about what's going on in the Curious Geographer as well so I'll give you some more information but apart from that have a lovely summer everybody and thank you very much for tuning in.